Wedding guests. What was your reaction when the bridezilla was hiding from you? Story 1. Let's start with my husband's best man. Now this guy, let's call him Dave, is generally a good guy, but on our wedding day he decided to get high, before the ceremony, during the reception, and even afterward in our backyard. It wasn't just a little buzz either. He was completely out of it. I remember glancing over during our vows, and there he was, eyes glazed over, grinning like a fool. Later, at the reception, he was a mess, knocking over drinks, slurring his words, and at one point, I think he tried to have a deep conversation with our wedding cake. My husband was furious, but what could we do? The damage was done. As if that wasn't enough, an acquaintance of mine, let's call him Mike, who I hadn't even invited, decided to crash the wedding. Now, Mike is the kind of guy who always seems to be involved in something shady, and this time was no different. He started mingling with the older guests, and at first, I thought he was just being friendly. But then I overheard him asking one of my elderly uncles if he could buy some pain meds off him. Seriously? Who does that at a wedding? I had to pull him aside and tell him to leave before he caused any more trouble, but the damage was already done. People were talking, and not in a good way. Then there was my aunt, oh my aunt. She's always been a bit of a wild card, but I never thought she'd stoop so low. At some point during the reception, she stole $100 of our gift money. I noticed it was missing when I went to collect the cards and cash, and when I confronted her, she flat out denied it. It wasn't until I mentioned that there were cameras in the reception hall, which there weren't, that she started backtracking, saying it was all a misunderstanding. But the mood was already ruined. I couldn't believe my own family would do that to me on my wedding day. But the cherry on top of this disaster Sunday was one of my mother's friends. This woman, bless her heart, is well into her 80s and decided to get absolutely plastered. Now, I have nothing against people having a good time, but she took it to a whole new level. At one point, she cornered me and started giving me some unsolicited marital advice. This wasn't the sweet grandmotherly advice you'd expect. It was graphic and entirely inappropriate, especially considering she was doing this in front of my husband's parents and grandparents. I was mortified. I kept trying to steer the conversation elsewhere, but she was relentless. Eventually, her antics escalated to the point where the catering hall staff had to step in. She started harassing the wait staff, making crude comments, and even tried to grab one of the servers as they walked by. It was a mess. The staff had no choice but to physically remove her from the premises. I remember watching her being escorted out and thinking, is this really happening? By the end of the night, I was exhausted, not from the excitement of the day, but from the sheer chaos of it all. I had imagined my wedding day being this perfect, beautiful event, and instead, it felt like I was in the middle of some twisted comedy. I was angry, disappointed, and just plain worn out. Story 2. The bride, let's call her Lisa, had a much older sister. Let's say her name was Susan. Now, Susan was in her early 40s at the time, while Lisa was 26. They were close enough in the way that siblings are, but there was always a bit of an odd dynamic between them. Susan had a tendency to be the center of attention, and not always in a good way. She'd been known to drink a little too much at family gatherings, and was never shy about letting loose in front of a crowd. But no one could have predicted what she had in store for us that night. As the evening went on, people were hitting the dance floor with increasing enthusiasm. The DJ was playing one hit after another, and everyone was having a blast. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed Susan making her way to the middle of the dance floor. She was a bit tipsy, but at first it seemed like she just wanted to join in on the fun. But then something changed. She started swaying her hips a little too suggestively, and before anyone really knew what was happening, she began to unbutton her blouse. The thing is, Susan was never really the type to be self-conscious. But let's just say, she didn't have the body of a woman who should be stripping in public. Not that there's ever a good time for that at a wedding. But she was determined, and in her mind, she was putting on the performance of a lifetime. It was like a car crash. You didn't want to look, but you couldn't turn away. Everyone around the dance floor just sort of froze, watching in disbelief as Susan continued her impromptu striptease. She got her blouse halfway off before one of the bridesmaids rushed over, trying to talk her down. But Susan was on a mission. She tossed her blouse to the side and reached for the zipper on her skirt. That's when the groomsmen and I realized we had to intervene. We couldn't just let this happen, not in the middle of a wedding reception. I remember looking at the groom, who had a mix of horror and disbelief on his face, and knew we had to act fast. Myself and a couple of the other guys made our way over to Susan and gently but firmly took her by the arms. Susan, it's time to go, I said as calmly as I could trying to keep the situation from escalating further. She was too far gone to really understand what was happening, but she didn't resist as we guided her off the dance floor. The whole thing felt like it was happening in slow motion, with everyone in the room staring in stunned silence. Once we got her outside, we had a quick huddle to figure out what to do next. There was no way we could let her back into the reception, not after what had just happened. 
So we decided to give her a very polite but firm request to leave. One of the other groomsmen called her a cab and we waited with her until it arrived, making sure she didn't try to sneak back in. By the time we returned to the reception, the mood had definitely shifted. People were trying to pick up where they left off, but there was this awkward tension hanging in the air. The bride and groom were trying their best to put on brave faces, but you could tell the whole thing had rattled them. Despite the awkwardness, the party slowly got back on track. The DJ, bless him, cranked up the volume and switched to some upbeat tunes to lighten the mood. The drinks kept coming, and after a while, people were laughing and dancing again, although the memory of Susan's performance lingered in the back of everyone's minds. Story 3. Weddings, they say, bring out the best and the worst in people. And let me tell you, my cousin's wedding was no exception. This wasn't just any wedding, it was a family showdown for the ages. The kind of story that gets passed around at every Thanksgiving and Christmas, with everyone chiming in to add their two cents. But the way I remember it, the whole thing went down like this. First, you've got to understand the backstory. My two aunts, AMK and AC, had been at each other's throats for years. It all started after another one of their siblings passed away, and the inheritance was, to put it mildly, a disaster. Money has a way of driving a wedge between people, and in this case, it drove a whole damn canyon. AMK was always the no-nonsense type, raised in the tough streets of inner-city Philly, where you either grow a backbone or get walked all over. AC, on the other hand, had a bit of a narcissistic streak, always thinking the world revolved around her. They could barely be in the same room without sparks flying. Now fast forward to my cousin's wedding. Just two weeks before the big day, tragedy struck again. The bride's mother, who was also AMK and AC's sister, passed away suddenly from a heart attack. It was a devastating blow, especially so close to such a joyous occasion. But AMK, true to form, stepped up and made sure everything went off without a hitch. She was determined to make sure her niece had the wedding day she deserved, despite the shadow of loss hanging over the family. AC, however, was less focused on the bride and more on her own grief. The tension between the two sisters was thick, and it all came to a head in the most unlikely of places. The bath AC, overcome with emotion, started crying to AMK about how much she missed their sister how hard it was that she wasn't there. Now, any other person might have offered some comfort, a shoulder to cry on, but AMK wasn't having it. This wasn't the time or the place. She looked AC dead in the eye and told her to grow the hell up. This day isn't about you, she said. It's about your niece. If you can't handle that, you need to get the F asterisk 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 out. AC did not take that well. She stormed out of the bathroom and went straight to her son, TJ. Now, TJ was a sight to behold. He got the height from his father, who had gigantism, and stood a towering 7'2", weighing in at a solid 320 pounds. But unlike his dad, TJ had good health, which only made him more imposing. TJ was a loyal son, and when his mom came crying to him about how AMK had treated her, he decided he wasn't going to let it slide. So there we were, in the middle of the reception, just moments before the bride and groom were supposed to be introduced. The hall was buzzing with excitement. Everyone chatting, drinking, and waiting for the party to really get started. And then suddenly, there was silence. TJ had found AMK, and the two of them were facing off like a scene out of an old western. He started yelling, trying to use his size to intimidate her, calling her a nasty bad person in front of the entire room. Now AMK might have been small. She was barely 5'3", but what she lacked in height, she more than made up for in sheer, unfiltered toughness. You could see the shift in the room, like the air had been sucked out, and everyone was holding their breath. TJ was used to people backing down when he threw his weight around, but AMK wasn't most people. Without missing a beat, AMK calmly walked over to one of the tables, grabbed a chair, and dragged it right in front of TJ. The entire room was dead silent, all eyes on them. She climbed up onto the chair so she could look him dead in the eye, and then she smacked him. Hard. The sound echoed through the hall like a gunshot. The whole room gasped as TJ stumbled back, holding his face where she'd hit him. And then, AMK, with all the fire of someone half her size, shouted, I don't care how F asterisk 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 inning big you are! You could be 10 feet tall and 1,500 pounds, and I'd still find a way to kick your ass! TJ was in shock, as was everyone else. AMK, still standing on that chair, looked down at him, pulled a napkin from the table, and tossed it at him for his bleeding nose. Then, she pointed toward the door and said, Now grab your mother and get the hell out of here. TJ and AC didn't say a word. They just turned and walked out and we haven't heard from them since. It's been nearly 10 years now, and they've completely cut themselves off from the family. But the story lives on, a testament to AMK's no-nonsense attitude and the length she'd go to protect her family, even if it meant taking down someone twice her size. It was the wedding that no one in my family will ever forget. And to this day, we still talk about it whenever we get together.
The day TJ learned the hard way that size doesn't always matter, especially when you're up against a woman like AMK. Story 4. I witnessed this firsthand at my friend's wedding. A day that should have been all about love and unity, but instead turned into a battlefield over something as simple as a money dance. Now, if you're not familiar with the tradition, a money dance is where guests pay for the honor of dancing with the bride or groom, usually pinning cash to their clothes or slipping it into a purse. It's a fun way to raise some extra cash for the newlyweds, but it's not for everyone. Some people find it tacky or just plain uncomfortable. The bride in this case, let's call her Emily, was firmly in the no money dance camp. She and her groom, Mark, had argued about it a few times leading up to the wedding. But Emily was adamant there would be no money dance at her wedding. End of story. Or so she thought. Mark's mother, however, had other ideas. She was a traditionalist, the kind who believed that weddings should follow certain customs, no matter what. And to her, the money dance was as essential as the first kiss. She couldn't wrap her head around why Emily was so against it. Emily had tried to explain how it made her uncomfortable, how it wasn't something she wanted as part of her special day. But her new mother-in-law wasn't having it. In her mind, this was a wedding, and weddings had money dances. Period. So, fast forward to the reception. Everything was going smoothly. Beautiful venue, great music, everyone having a good time. The MC was keeping things lively, announcing the cake cutting, the bouquet toss, all the usual wedding stuff. Emily was finally relaxing thinking that maybe she'd gotten through to her mother-in-law and that the money dance issue was behind them. But then, the unthinkable happened. Right after the toasts, just as everyone was settling in for the next round of dancing, Mark's mom made her move. She snatched the microphone from the MC and with a smile plastered on her face, announced to the entire room, Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the money dance. Let's show the bride and groom how much we love them. The room went dead silent. All eyes turned to Emily, who was standing there, frozen. It was like the air had been sucked out of the room. You could see the shock and anger building in her eyes, and before anyone could say a word, she bolted for the bathroom, her face crumpling into sobs as she ran. The bridesmaids, bless their hearts, sprang into action. They followed Emily, surrounding her in the bathroom like a protective wall, while the rest of us were left in the awkward aftermath of what had just happened. The mother-in-law, completely oblivious to the storm she'd just unleashed, stood there with the microphone, waiting for someone to start pinning money on Emily's dress. But no one moved. The silence was suffocating. Eventually, the MC, looking a bit panicked, gently took the microphone back and tried to smooth things over. It seems there's been a bit of a mix-up, he said, his voice shaking. Let's get back to the music, shall we? The DJ, God bless him, immediately cranked up a song trying to salvage the mood, but it was too late. The tension in the room was thick, and everyone was just uncomfortable. Meanwhile, in the bathroom, Emily was inconsolable. The bridesmaids did their best to calm her down, reassuring her that she had every right to be upset that she wasn't overreacting. This was her day, and it had been hijacked by someone who couldn't let go of their own need for control. After a few minutes, Emily managed to pull herself together enough to return to the reception, but the damage was done. Her eyes were red from crying, and her smile was forced. She spent the rest of the evening surrounded by her bridesmaids, who took turns playing, keep the mother-in-law away. As for the mother-in-law, she spent the rest of the night sulking in a corner, clearly displeased that her tradition had been so unceremoniously squashed. There was no money dance that night, and the tension between Emily and her new mother-in-law was palpable for the rest of the evening. In the days that followed, the fallout from that moment was significant. Emily and Mark had a serious talk about boundaries and about how things were going to work when it came to dealing with his mother. Mark, to his credit, stood by Emily, understanding that his mother had crossed a line that couldn't be ignored. But the relationship between Emily and her mother-in-law was never quite the same. Story 5 Family is supposed to be your safe haven, the people who know you best and love you despite your flaws. But what happens when that same family decides to turn against you? That's what happened to me, and it's something that still stings every time I think about it. I'm the oldest of three, with two younger sisters who, for reasons I still don't fully understand, decided one day that it would be hilarious, or maybe just spiteful, to spread rumors about me. Not just any rumors, mind you, but the kind that make your blood run cold. They told our family that I was a homicidal maniac. Yes, you heard that right. My own sisters were going around telling people that I was dangerous, that they were afraid of me, and that everyone else should be too. It started small, with them whispering to our younger cousins that they should stay away from me because I had a dark side. At first, I thought they were just being the usual annoying little sisters, trying to get a rise out of me. But then I started noticing the way our cousins would look at me when I walked into a room. They'd get quiet, avoid eye contact, and make excuses to leave as quickly as possible. It was like I had some sort of contagious disease. It wasn't until one of our family gatherings that I realized just how far they'd taken it. 
we were all sitting around the table when one of my aunts asked in a half-joking, half-serious tone if I had calmed down lately. I had no idea what she was talking about, so I just laughed it off. But then another relative chimed in, saying something about how it was good that I hadn't snapped yet. The whole table got quiet, and that's when I knew something was seriously wrong. After a bit of prying, I found out that my sisters had been telling everyone in the family that I had some kind of violent tendencies. They made up stories about me getting into fights at school, which never happened, about me threatening people, which also never happened, and even hinted that I had a stash of weapons hidden in my room, which, obviously, was complete nonsense. They painted this picture of me as some sort of ticking time bomb, and our younger cousins, being impressionable kids, believed every word of it. It was like being punched in the gut. I was furious, hurt, and confused all at the same time. I confronted my sisters about it, demanding to know why they would say such horrible things about me. They just laughed it off like it was some kind of joke that I didn't get. They said they were just messing around and that it was funny to see how everyone reacted. But it wasn't funny to me. Not at all. The worst part was the aftermath. Even after I tried to clear things up, explaining to everyone that my sisters were just being stupid and immature, the damage was done. Our younger cousins still looked at me like I was some kind of monster. And some of the older family members seemed unsure of what to believe. It was like there was this invisible wall between me and the rest of the family, built on lies and fueled by my sister's twisted sense of humor. For a long time, I couldn't even stand to be around them. I hated them both for what they'd done, for turning our family against me, even if it was just in their minds. They didn't seem to care, though. They went on with their lives like nothing had happened, while I was left to pick up the pieces of my reputation. It was like they didn't realize or didn't care about the impact their words had on me. To this day, I've never really forgiven them. How could I? How do you forgive someone for something like that? For making people you love afraid of you? For making you out to be something you're not? I don't think I'll ever be able to fully trust them again. And that's the saddest part of all. They're my sisters, but they've made themselves into strangers to me. They say blood is thicker than water, but sometimes I wonder if that's really true. Because in my case, it feels like the blood between us has been poisoned. And I don't know if it'll ever be clean again. Story 6. So let's rewind to that fateful day. My mom worked with this woman who was getting married, and somehow she convinced herself it was a good idea to bring me along to the wedding. Now, I was five, so in my mind, weddings were just big parties where grown-ups did boring things like talk and dance while I ran around trying to find something fun to do. On this particular day, my fun involved eyeing that gigantic cake with a growing sense of curiosity. I'd never seen anything like it. It was like a beacon, calling out to me from across the room with its layers of frosting, intricate decorations, and the little bride and groom perched on top. It looked like it was just begging to be touched, poked, maybe even tasted. As the ceremony was getting underway and all the adults were occupied, my five-year-old brain went into overdrive. I'm not entirely sure what came over me. Maybe it was the sugar high from the candy I'd already managed to sneak, or maybe I was just born with a natural talent for causing chaos, but I decided then and there that I needed to be closer to that cake. And by closer, I mean on it. Before anyone could stop me, I broke into a full sprint, arms pumping like I was running a marathon. My mom saw me out of the corner of her eye and yelled for me to stop, but it was too late. I was already committed. With a leap that would have made an Olympic long jumper proud, I launched myself into the air and straight into the side of that cake. Time seemed to slow down as I made contact. There was a moment of silence, pure, stunned silence, as the cake wobbled, teetered, and then like something out of a cartoon, came crashing down. I was covered in frosting and cake a sticky mess from head to toe. The room erupted in gasps and shocked murmurs as everyone tried to process what had just happened. My mom was mortified. She rushed over, grabbed me by the arm, and started apologizing profusely to the bride and groom, who were standing there in a mix of disbelief and amusement. I could see the gears turning in her head as she calculated just how much this was going to cost and how long it would take to pay it off. But to my surprise, the bride and groom were unbelievably cool about it. They just started laughing, not that fake, polite laugh, but genuine belly-deep laughter. I guess they figured it was one of those things you couldn't really be mad about. I mean, how many people can say their wedding was so memorable because a tiny human decided to Hulk smash their cake? While the adults tried to clean up the mess I'd made, the bride came over and knelt down next to me. She looked at me, covered in frosting, with crumbs in my hair and a guilty look on my face, and said, You know what? This is going to be a story we'll tell forever. She wasn't wrong. That story has been told a million times, and it's never lost its punch. Every time, it gets the same reaction. Shock, followed by laughter, and then the inevitable questions. What were you thinking? Did you get in trouble? How much did that cake cost? As for my mom, well, she was less amused in the moment. 
she had to fork over a decent chunk of change to pay for that cake, which I'm sure stung at the time. But even she came around eventually. Now she can't tell the story without cracking a smile. It's become part of our family lore, a reminder of how unpredictable life with kids can be and how sometimes the most unexpected moments make for the best memories. Story 7. The groom's brother-in-law, let's call him John, had been quiet throughout the day. He wasn't exactly the life of the party, but no one really noticed anything off. After all, weddings can be overwhelming, and not everyone wears their emotions on their sleeve. But after the meal, John disappeared. It wasn't unusual for guests to take a break, maybe go for a walk around the castle grounds or retreat to one of the many rooms for a bit of solitude. No one thought much of it at first. But time passed, and John didn't return. His absence started to become noticeable, especially to his 16-year-old daughter. She went looking for him, probably thinking he just needed a bit of company or someone to talk to. I can't even imagine what was going through her mind as she searched the castle, room by room. And then she found him. I was upstairs in my room at the time, maybe taking a break from the noise and festivities. The castle was so large that you could easily feel like you were the only person around, even with hundreds of guests just a floor below. The first thing I heard was a scream, unlike anything I've ever heard before or since. It was the kind of scream that chills you to your core, full of pure, unfiltered terror and pain. It echoed through the stone halls, reaching me even from a distance. My heart sank, and I knew, even before anyone said a word, that something terrible had happened. John's daughter had found him hanging in one of the bedrooms. The man who had been so quiet, so seemingly at peace, had taken his own life in the middle of what was supposed to be a day of happiness. I can't begin to imagine the horror she must have felt in that moment, seeing her father like that. The shock and the grief hitting her all at once. The reception came to a grinding halt. Word spread quickly, and what had been a celebration turned into a scene of chaos and disbelief. People were crying, others were in shock, and no one knew what to do or say. The bride and groom, who had been so full of joy just moments before, were now faced with an unimaginable tragedy on their wedding day. I stayed in my room, not knowing where to go or how to help. The screams, those horrible, piercing screams, kept ringing in my ears. It was as if they had been burned into my mind, a sound that I knew would haunt me for the rest of my life. I could hear people rushing through the halls, trying to offer comfort. But what comfort could there possibly be in a situation like that? A man was dead, his daughter had found him, and everything had changed in an instant. The rest of the evening was a blur. The authorities were called, and the guests were asked to stay in their rooms or gather in small groups as they tried to process what had happened. It felt surreal, like something out of a nightmare, but it was all too real. The castle, once filled with the sounds of laughter and music, was now silent, save for the hushed voices of people trying to make sense of it all. The wedding, of course, was over. There was no going back to the way things were just hours before. The bride and groom, who had been at the center of this joyous occasion, were now left to grapple with the shock and sadness of what had unfolded on their special day. And John's daughter, that poor girl, would carry the weight of that moment with her for the rest of her life. Story 8. The groom, let's call him Jake, had recently gone through something pretty intense. He'd been diagnosed with testicular cancer, and just a few weeks before the wedding, he had one of his testicles removed. Now, I'm sure that's a life-altering experience, and dealing with it right before your wedding couldn't have been easy. But Jake seemed to be taking it all in stride, maybe even a little too well. As the night wore on, the drinks started flowing, and Jake, feeling the effects of a few too many, decided it was time to share his recent experience in a way that no one was expecting or asking. At some point during the reception, he disappeared from the main hall and made his way to the men's room. Normally, this wouldn't be anything worth noting, but this was no ordinary bathroom break. Word quickly spread among the male guests that Jake was in the men's room, holding court with anyone who would listen. Naturally, curiosity got the better of a lot of guys, and soon enough, about 20 of them had crammed into the bath, eager to see what the groom was up to. I decided to check it out myself, not realizing what I was walking into. When I got there, the scene was something straight out of a frat house prank. Jake was standing in the middle of the bathroom, shirt untucked and a drink still in hand, with a grin on his face like he was the star of the show. And in a way he was. He had gathered this crowd of guys around him, and before anyone could really grasp what was happening, he announced that he wanted to show everyone what was left of his manhood. Yep, you heard that right. He was proud of the fact that he was now the owner of just one testicle, and in his drunken state, thought it was something worth displaying. So, right there in the men's room, Jake unzipped his pants and dropped them enough to show off his recent surgery. The crowd was a mix of stunned silence and awkward laugh, no one quite sure how to react. It was one of those moments where you're not sure if you should laugh, cringe, or just walk away. But Jake wasn't done yet. As if showing off his surgical scar wasn't enough, 
he decided to take things one step further. With everyone watching, he turned to the nearest sink and proceeded to relieve himself in it. That's right, he peed in the sink, right in front of all those guys, like it was the most natural thing in the world. The whole scene was beyond bizarre, and I'm sure most of us were wondering what the hell was going through his mind. I mean, sure, weddings can bring out some strange behavior, especially when alcohol is involved. But this was on another level. Here was the groom on his wedding day, with a room full of people waiting for him to get back to the reception, and he was in the bathroom, pants down, showing off his surgery and peeing in a sink. It was the kind of thing you wouldn't believe if you hadn't seen it with your own eyes. Eventually, someone managed to steer Jake out of the bathroom and back to the reception, where to everyone else he appeared none the worse for wear. The rest of the night went on as planned, dancing, more drinking, and the usual wedding festivities. But for those of us who had witnessed the bathroom incident, it was impossible to forget. Story 9. Right after college, I found myself tending bar at this massive event space that seemed to be built specifically for weddings. It was a busy place, and we cranked out weddings like they were going out of style, about 90 a year. I worked there for two years, so you can imagine the number of wild and crazy things I saw. But there's one wedding that sticks out in my memory, not because it was the most extravagant or the most beautiful, but because it was an absolute disaster. And all thanks to the groom and his side of the wedding party. This was a big one, too. The guest list was around 300 people, and they'd really gone all out. The place was stocked to the gills with booze, six kegs, 25 cases of wine, and of course, an open bar that would have kept us busy all night long. Everything was set up for one hell of a party. The guests were arriving, the music was starting to pump through the speakers, and the atmosphere was electric. You could tell people were ready to let loose and celebrate, but just as the reception was about to kick into high gear, Something went down in the parking lot that changed the course of the entire evening. It turned out that the groom and his buddies decided they needed a little extra something to get the party started. So they piled into one of the cars and started doing candy. For the uninitiated, that's a not-so-subtle way of saying they were using, and not the kind you can buy over the counter. Now, you'd think they'd have been a bit more discreet, especially with so many people around, but nope. Someone must have noticed the suspicious activity and tipped off the authorities. Because before anyone inside the reception knew what was happening, the entire groom's side of the wedding party was getting arrested in the parking lot. I remember one of the wait staff coming in, wide-eyed, and saying, you won't believe what's going on outside. It was like a scene out of a movie. The groom, his groomsmen, and even a few others from their side of the family were all handcuffed and being led away by the police. Right there in front of everyone. It was chaos. Guests were spilling out of the reception hall, trying to figure out what was happening, while others just stood there, stunned. The bride was inside, completely oblivious at first, but word travels fast, and soon enough, she knew her wedding day had taken a sharp turn for the worse. You could feel the energy in the room shift. The excitement that had been building up all day evaporated in an instant, replaced by a kind of uncomfortable tension. They tried to keep the party going. After all, there were still hundreds of guests who had no intention of letting a little drama ruin their night. The band kept playing, the drinks kept flowing, but it was clear that the night wasn't going to recover from that kind of shock. I remember watching the bride, standing there in her beautiful dress, looking like she was trying to hold it all together. You could see the strain in her smile as she tried to put on a brave face for her guests, but it was obvious she was devastated. This was supposed to be the happiest day of her life, and instead it was turning into a nightmare. There's something about seeing someone's dream unravel right in front of you that sticks with you. She'd planned for everything except for this. Despite the efforts to keep the celebration alive, the reception never really got back on track. People were talking in hushed tones, speculating about what had happened, and the whole atmosphere was just off. Guests started leaving earlier than they might have otherwise, and those who stayed didn't seem to be in much of a partying mood. What was supposed to be a wild, joyous celebration ended up fizzling out into an awkward, uncomfortable gathering, with everyone just trying to get through the night. As for the groom and his buddies, they spent the night in jail. I don't know what happened after that, whether they made bail and showed up sheepishly the next morning, or if there were deeper repercussions that followed. But I'll never forget the look on that bride's face as the reality of the situation sunk in. She was standing there, surrounded by the remnants of her perfect day, trying to salvage something from the wreckage. But you could see that part of her just wanted to disappear. Story 10. The venue was top-notch. A high-end hotel right in the heart of Seattle. The kind of place where everything is polished to perfection, and you expect the evening to be sophisticated and smooth. The couple had planned it all meticulously even down to the drink situation. Every guest who RSVP'd received two free drink vouchers at their assigned seats, which was a nice touch. But here's where things started to go sideways. About 50 guests didn't show up. That meant there were a lot of extra drink vouchers floating around, 
and you can guess what happened next. It didn't take long for those vouchers to be snapped up by the guests who did show. Before you knew it, the whole place was filled with people getting seriously. I mean, this wasn't just a buzz or a nice glow. People were absolutely hammered. The groomsmen, in particular, took full advantage of the situation. At one point, they were literally doing backflips off the serving counters, screaming and hollering like they were at a frat party instead of a wedding reception. The energy in the room went from festive to chaotic in no time flat. Then there was this one lady who got it into her head that the dance floor needed more color. She looked around, saw the water pearl decorations on the tables, those little beads that swell up in water, and thought, perfect, next thing we know, she's scooping them up and tossing them all over the dance floor, thinking it would look pretty. In reality, it just made the floor a slippery mess, with people nearly wiping out left and right. But that wasn't the worst of it. One guy got so drunk he crossed the line from fun to belligerent. He took his drink and, for reasons only he could understand, dumped it right into one of the candles on a martini table. Then he tried to flip the table over in some bizarre show of strength or frustration, but thank God the table was bolted down. When that didn't work, he decided to yank the tablecloth, sending candles, glasses, and everything else crashing to the floor. Chaos doesn't even begin to cover it. Security finally stepped in and asked him to leave. But as he was being escorted out, he decided to take one last swing, literally. He backhanded one of the women guests, leaving her with a bloody lip. He claimed it was an accident, just him excitedly waving his arms around, but no one was buying that. Fortunately, he was finally out the door, but the madness was far from over. At this point, the bride and groom were just as drunk as everyone else. The groom, bless his heart, decided to fixate on me. Well, more specifically, on my banana. He started following his bride around, shouting, Look at Tony's banana! Tony has a huge banana! You have to look at Tony's banana. Let me tell you, I'm Tony and my banana is pretty average. Thank you very much. And to make it all even weirder, the groom had never seen my banana, so I have no clue what possessed him to start this bizarre chant. But it didn't stop there. The groom, in his drunken state, actually tried to pull down my pants to show off my so-called banana to his new wife. That was my cue to make a graceful exit because clearly, things were only going to get more out of hand from there. The next day, I got a call from another friend who had stuck around a bit longer than I did. Apparently, I left just in time to miss the groom having a full-on meltdown in front of his new bride and his mom. There he was, crying and asking, Mom, did I just make a mistake? What did I do, Mom? Not exactly the kind of start you want to a marriage, but somehow they pulled through. Story 11. The groom was my cousin, and the bride's side of the family was a bit older, more traditional. We were seated with some of her older relatives, including her aunt and uncle, who were the kind of folks who you'd expect to politely sip their wine and quietly chat about the weather or the flowers. Dinner had been served and everything was going smoothly. The food was great, the conversation pleasant, and it looked like the night was shaping up to be a lovely one. After dinner, the bride's aunt and uncle excused themselves, saying they needed a little break and were heading upstairs to rest. They were in their golden years, so no one thought anything of it. We all continued chatting, enjoying the evening, when my sister came over to join us at the table. She had just settled in when we started noticing something off. At first, it was just a hint of something strange in the air. We exchanged puzzled glances, wondering if someone had spilled something, or if it was just a weird scent wafting in from the kitchen. But the smell wasn't going away. In fact, it was getting stronger. It wasn't long before it hit us. This wasn't just any smell. This was an odor most foul. The kind that makes you want to quietly back away from the source without making a scene. We all tried to pretend like nothing was happening, but the curiosity was killing us. My sister, who has always had a knack for solving mysteries, went into full-on detective mode. She suddenly started sniffing the air, moving around the table like a bloodhound on the trail. It didn't take long before she zeroed in on the chair where the aunt had been sitting. It became painfully clear what had happened. The poor woman must have had an accident before she excused herself, and in her haste to leave, she hadn't realized she'd left a little something behind. The realization hit us all at once, and we struggled to keep straight faces. It was one of those moments where you're torn between feeling embarrassed for the person involved and trying not to laugh at the absurdity of it all. But what happened next is what really stuck with me. My sister, who's always been the unflappable one in the family, didn't miss a beat. Instead of making a scene or letting the moment ruin the evening, she just calmly got up, made an excuse about needing to change, and disappeared upstairs. A few minutes later, she returned, looking fresh and unbothered, having swapped her dress for a spare she'd brought along, her trusty Plan B dress. We quietly removed the chair from the table and pretended like nothing had happened. The smell was gone, the mystery solved, and the party went on. My sister's quick thinking and graceful handling of the situation saved the day. No one else at the wedding seemed to notice a thing, 
and before long we were all back to dancing, drinking, and enjoying the night. Story 12. The bride who everyone was eager to see was a no-show for most of the evening. She made her first appearance for the ceremony as expected. She walked down the aisle looking stunning, said her vows, and the whole thing went off without a hitch. But then, just as quickly as she appeared, she vanished. After the ceremony, she retreated back into the dressing room, leaving the guests to mingle and enjoy the cocktail hour. People assumed she was just taking a breather, maybe freshening up or getting ready for the next part of the evening. But the cocktail hour came and went, and the bride still didn't reappear. Conversations started to shift from polite chatter to whispers of concern. Where's the bride? People began to ask. Is everything okay? The groom, for his part, tried to keep things moving along. He was out there with the guests, smiling and chatting. But you could tell he was distracted, always glancing toward the dressing room as if he was waiting for her to come back. But she didn't, not yet anyway. When it was time for pictures, she finally came out looking as flawless as she had during the ceremony. The photographer snapped the required shots bride and groom, the wedding party, family photos. But as soon as the camera clicked its last shot, she was gone again, back to the dressing room, like she was escaping something. The dinner service started, and the guests were served a lavish meal, but the bride was nowhere to be seen. By this point, people were starting to notice in earnest. Weddings are a time to celebrate, to see the happy couple basking in their joy, and yet the bride was missing in action. It wasn't until after everyone had eaten that she reappeared. She slipped out of the dressing room, joined her groom for a quick meal, and then did the traditional dances. The first dance, the father-daughter dance, all the required steps that make up a wedding reception. And then, just as quickly, she was gone again. Back to the dressing room, where she stayed for the rest of the night. The guests tried to carry on, but there was an undeniable tension in the air. A wedding without the bride is like a play missing its lead actor. People danced, they drank, they tried to enjoy themselves, but there was this undercurrent of unease. What was going on? Why was she hiding away? Everyone had their theories. Cold feet, anxiety, maybe something had gone wrong behind the scenes. But no one really knew. It was like there was this big, unanswered question hanging over the night. Eventually, the reception started to wind down. People began to leave, still unsure of what to make of the evening. The bride didn't make another appearance until it was time to pack up and leave. There she was, suddenly back in the mix, but only long enough to say quick goodbyes before disappearing into the night with her groom. As we left, everyone couldn't help but feel a bit bewildered. This was supposed to be the bride's night, the one time she was supposed to be front and center, basking in the love and attention of everyone around her. Instead, it felt like she'd spent the entire night hiding, coming out only when absolutely necessary. It was a beautiful wedding, no doubt about that, but it was also one of the strangest I've ever been to. Story 13. Being part of a choir that sings at weddings, you get to witness all sorts of ceremonies, some beautiful, some touching, and some downright dramatic. But there's one wedding that stands out in my memory, not because of the songs we sang, but because of what happened during the does anyone have any objections moment. It was a scene straight out of a movie, but unfortunately, it was all too real. We were in the middle of a pretty traditional wedding, the kind where everything seems to be going smoothly, right up until that pivotal moment when the officiant asks if anyone has any reason why the couple shouldn't be married. Usually, this part of the ceremony is just a formality, a brief pause before the vows, with everyone holding their breath for a second and then relaxing when nothing happens. But this time, something did happen. Something no one was prepared for. The woman in the front row, who I later learned was likely the mother of the bride, suddenly stood up. There was a collective gasp from the guests as she made her way to the center aisle, and for a moment you could feel the tension in the room skyrocket. Everyone was waiting to hear what she had to say, and the atmosphere shifted from one of joy to one of dread in a heartbeat. Instead of objecting to the marriage, which is what everyone feared, she did something arguably worse. She turned to the crowd and, in a voice that was both casual and cutting, announced that if anyone didn't feel like attending the reception, she and her husband would be hosting a barbecue at their house instead. It was like a bomb had gone off in the church. You could see the shock ripple through the guests, but the worst part was the bride's reaction. The bride, who had been glowing with happiness just moments before, crumpled under the weight of her mother's words. She burst into tears, her sobs echoing through the silent church. It was heartbreaking to watch. You could see the groom's face tighten, his jaw clenched with anger. He was a big guy, the kind who could probably lift a car if he had to, and for a moment, it looked like he was about to lose it. If he had, I'm not sure the mother would have fared well. He looked ready to body check her right out of the building. The bridesmaids quickly sprang into action, huddling around the bride to comfort her while also trying to defuse the situation. It took all of them working together to get the mother out of the church. She didn't put up much of a fight, almost as if she didn't realize the devastation she'd just caused. Or maybe she didn't care. 
Either way, she was escorted out and the wedding was able to continue, but the damage had been done. The bride, still in tears, tried to compose herself, but you could see the hurt in her eyes. She was supposed to be the happiest person in the room, but instead, she was standing at the altar, crying through her vows. The groom, doing his best to hold it together, kept glancing at her, clearly torn between anger and the need to comfort her. The ceremony dragged on, the words heavy with the tension that had settled over the room. As we in the choir sang, trying to maintain the uplifting tone that weddings are supposed to have, it was hard not to feel the weight of what had just happened. The joy that should have filled the room was tainted, overshadowed by the thoughtless actions of a woman who should have been there to support her daughter, not undermine her. The rest of the ceremony was a blur. The couple managed to get through their vows, exchange rings, and even share a kiss. But the energy was different. The guests were quiet, subdued, as if they were all walking on eggshells, afraid that any moment could bring another disaster. After the ceremony, as the couple exited the church, there was an awkward silence among the guests. People weren't sure whether to offer congratulations or sympathy. The bride and groom did their best to smile for the photos, but you could tell it wasn't the day they had dreamed of. As for the reception, it did happen. But it was clear that the mother's invitation to her barbecue had cast a long shadow over the festivities. Some guests, perhaps out of discomfort or misplaced loyalty, decided to take her up on her offer, leaving the reception less crowded than it should have been. The whole thing felt bittersweet, like a celebration that had lost its spark before it even began.